inheritance and a heritage of the Lord. Blessed is the man that has his quiver full of them, the Bible says. So, yeah, thank God. Our children are filled with faith, filled with the grace of God. Uh, I used to just, when I used to live in Winnipeg, walk into church in the morning, you know, there'd be kids playing, and I got to know all the kids in my neighborhood, you know, they got to know me. Uh, and uh, I would just thank God to be able to share the good news of the gospel with them. Hallelujah. And when you're engaged with furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ, God shall supply all your needs by his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And there's nothing greater than what God's doing in people's lives today on the earth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Hallelujah. So our, our vision and mission for this church, why we're here, you know, is, is to win in life and to lead people, hallelujah, in a Christ-centered life. Our mission is to lead people in a Christ-centered life, a Holy Spirit life, a Word of Faith life. Our mission here is to give life and give it more abundantly. I've got the same mission that Jesus has himself. Jesus says, as God sent me, so send I you. In my name, go. So I try to stay on the same mission, on the same word, with the same power, and I get the same results as Jesus himself did. Because he said, greater works than these shall you do, because I'm going to the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. So my heart's desire to lead people in a Christ-centered, spirit-filled, word of faith life. Amen. Jesus wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus wants us to know him and the power of his resurrection. Jesus wants us to live and not die. Jesus wants us to be strong in him and the power of his might. Amen? That's what Jesus wants. How do you know what Jesus wants? Well, let's go to the Bible and look at Jesus because Jesus did everything God wanted him to do. Everything. Everything God was thinking, Jesus was doing it in the physical body. Because Jesus is the invisible manifestation of God in the flesh, dwelling among us. And because he did everything God did in the flesh, he's called Emmanuel, God with us. That's his name, Emmanuel, God with us. And then he has all the other names that were in the Old Testament, that God identified himself to the children of Israel. Jehovah Rapha was the first name God revealed to his children after he delivered them from the bondage of Egypt and brought them out of slavery into the promised land. He said, I am the Lord that heals you. God is a healing God because without healing, how can you live for his glory? And there was not one feeble person among that three million group of people as they left Egypt with all the silver and the gold and as they went going and then they got into, they, they had conflict, they had they had opposition, they had tests, they had trials, they had difficulties. Like every person here today has difficulties in pressing into the will of God. But God's will never changes. God's will in you will change the circumstances around you. It's God's will that changes everything. He is a willing God. And as long as we stick with the will of God, anything that's against the will of God has to be defeated. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. And so the enemies that we have are not people. People are not our enemies. Fear is our enemy. Sickness is our enemy. Right? Greed is our enemy. Unbelief is our enemy. Right? Brokenheartedness is really an enemy. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted so the power of God could come to their life and they could get up and be healed in their souls and they could walk with God and live by faith and have eternal life. So Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. He has anointed me to heal. Let's go to the Bible and let's look at what the will of God is for us today so we can press in and give thanks to God for his goodness. It's Thanksgiving weekend. I was just visiting my friends in Pakistan today on What's Up. We have two churches in Pakistan. We have a, an orphanage there, and then we have an evangelistic uh, work. And basically, we're connected with the gospel in Pakistan through our two missionary ambassadors, Mary and Cutie. And uh, 
So I was speaking to them this morning, just before we went into prayer, and uh, God is moving mightily in Pakistan. Hallelujah. And so I thank God for the seed sown. And when we give of our time and we give of our substance, like they gave to Jesus, Mary Magdalene was a woman that Jesus cast out seven devils from and loved her. And she just decided, well, if God's that good to me, I'm just going to follow him. So, Jesus, so Mary followed him around in all his gospel campaigns, all his preaching campaigns, and she had some money. And, you know, there was actually three Marys there. It's kind of interesting. And you look in, in Luke chapter uh, 18, that they ministered out of him from their substance. They financed the, the gospel that he was preaching. They financed it because Jesus healed the brokenhearted. He brought them back to life again, and they wanted to stay in the flow of that power and that life. And so they stuck close to Jesus, because where Jesus is, there is spirit and life. Jesus, where he is. It's exciting to live with Jesus. To have the Jesus kind of life is to have the life of power and love and a sound mind. And so that's automatically, you know, they, they begin to sow seeds into, into the gospel. They begin to sow to Jesus. And the people that began to sow into the gospel in Philippi through Paul's ministry, Paul declared the blessing of God over them that God will always supply your need as long as you're connected with me. You're connected with me, you got it made in the shade, we say. Right? You got it made. Really? Say, I got it made. I got it made in the shade. I'm under the shadow of the Almighty. I got it made. Amen? The Bible says that all the promises of God are yes and amen through Christ Jesus. And so you can never lose by giving it to Jesus. Like you said, labor not for the, for the things that perish, but labor for that which is unto eternal life. So I thank God. We celebrate Thanksgiving. And the reason why we celebrate Thanksgiving in October is because the harvest. We celebrate the harvest. And the harvest is the fruit of the seed that was sown at seed time. Without seed time, there'd be no harvest. So Thanksgiving is a celebration of harvest. Amen? It's a Thanksgiving where the farmers have their harvest and the gardeners have their harvest. And so I thank God that his word is not returned void, but it has produced a harvest. I thank God that every seed that we've sown has produced a harvest. And I'll tell you, when we sow into God's work and the job gets done, harvest is the completion of the beginning of the season. Hallelujah. It's just like when you start school, you don't get a test until the end of the class. You never get a test on the first day of school, do you? Because you haven't learned anything yet. Right? The test always comes after. Because really, a good teacher doesn't want anybody to fail. You know? And they're not throwing trick questions at you. Jesus' word always brings us to a harvest because he wants you to, you know, learn the word. Learn the word. Learn how to pray the word. Learn how to speak the word. Learn how to confess the word. And learn how to sow the word. And then rejoice at the end of the word. When the test comes, you pass the test because you know the word. The reason why you pass the test is because you know what you've learned. eh? You know what you've learned. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you shall find rest for your souls. So sometimes we got to have patience because we're learning and the test hasn't come yet. And when the test comes and we pass it, then we graduate and we receive the honor, hallelujah, of knowing what we're talking about, right? We receive the honor of having the experience and passing the test. Life is full of experiences. And every experience we have is an opportunity to succeed and apply what we know in the Word of God. The test uh, is the opportunity for application. Praise God. So really, uh, growing up in the faith life, growing up in the Christ-centered life, growing up as a, as, a, as a follower of Jesus Christ, 
It's all about edification and application. It's all about word coming in, word going out. It's all about the, the, the sowing and the harvest. Praise God. It's all about sowing and reaping. The grace of God, God's grace, is his free will given to all of us on Christ's account. What we don't deserve? See, mercy, now listen to this, there's two words here. There's grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. Grace is getting from God what you don't deserve based on the account of someone else that paid for it. It's got to be paid. You know, I can walk out of a restaurant without paying. as long as you've paid for it, <laughs> right? I can walk out of a restaurant without paying. Isn't that true? You can walk out of a restaurant without paying. You can jump into a brand new truck without paying. As long as somebody paid for that thing or you're going to end up in jail, right? Hey, is that true? Any of you that stolen vehicles, you know why you drive so fast. <laughs> you don't want to get caught. But I'm telling you, you don't have that fear anymore in Christ. Because it's paid for. You don't have to look behind you. I used to have to look behind me all the time for cops. You know, look behind me. Because I, it just seemed everywhere I wear, went, there was a cop somewhere. Just looking to get me, you know. I just about ended up in jail. And, and it just living that kind of life of always trying to escape judgment. You know. It's not healthy for you. It's not a healthy life. It breaks your heart. And Jesus says, I've come to heal the brokenhearted by letting you know that you're free to go. It's paid for. You don't have to look back anymore, man. It's done. God is for you. Who can be against you? Jesus has done something for you you don't know about. And that's why we preach the gospel. That's why the gospel is called good news. It's something someone's done for you that you don't know about yet. You don't know about it. And once you know about it, you're justified to act like you're rich because you are. Because it's true. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Amen. Free from fear. Free from condemnation. Free from inferiority and guilt. And brokenheartedness. And so you can, you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. As long as you know that grace has provided it. That grace has provided it. Has grace provided it? Then I can live in it. It's mine. And so you check the Bible. Because the Bible is... Filled with over 7,000 promises. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible has over 7,000 promises. And the word promise comes from the word grace. It's freely given. It's a promise. Amen. If he had to work for it, it wouldn't be a promise. It says if Abraham had to work to be a friend of God, if he had to prove something to God, then he would have never been a friend of God. Because it was by grace that Abraham became who he was. Who Abraham became was by the grace of God. God promised to him that he would make him great. And Abraham just had to believe the promise. And Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And he became a friend of God. We're friends of God by believing the promises of God. So grace is God's resources at Christ's expense giving into your life. So grace is God's provision. But faith, now that's another word. Like grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. You deserve death. But because of, you cry for mercy. Like when you're, when you get, have mercy on me. Have some mercy. I know I deserve, I know, you know, you should kill me right now. But if you apply mercy, then I'm not going to get what I deserve. If you apply grace, that's even better. I'm going to get what I don't deserve. So uh, mercy is not getting the bad. Grace is getting the good. And it's all in Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel, that Jesus heals today. And so we're going to go to Luke chapter 4, did I say? Yeah. That's where Jesus said. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives.
The reason why Jesus preaches is so you and I can have faith and do something about the situation we're in. The reason why Jesus preaches is so that we can have hope and we can apply faith in the situation. So let me tell you this. Grace is, is God's gift to us through Christ, and faith is our expression to God. Grace is edifying. Faith is applying. Faith is our expression to God. Faith, Jesus said to mankind, have faith in God. He didn't say have grace because he is grace. The Bible says Moses brought the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Why? So you could have faith and you can get up and do something because you know the will of God. You know the word of God. Praise God. And so uh, faith is our expression to God. God wants us to be expression. Thanksgiving is an expression. Thanksgiving is an expression. Thanksgiving is a faith expression of how the seed became a harvest, and we're thanking God for it. We're thanking God that the job got done. I thank God I finished that job yesterday, changing a the thermostat on my son's Impala, getting there in a hard to reach place. You know, and I got this thing in my garage. Just, I got this little button in my garage, and I hit it. And it says, that was easy. Bang, that was easy. And so, you know, I'm tired. I'm working. Finally got the thing done, you know. I began the job. I thought, I wonder if I should do that today or not. Saturday, should I try to do that job today? Well, I got started, you know. And it's like, you know, draining the antifreeze that was like sowing the seed now you're in it you got to finish it right you don't want to stop halfway through i mean what good is it right harvest is god's will to say to you it's done the job's done you can rejoice you can be thankful you can hit the that was easy button you know even though it wasn't easy god helped you and then you can say that was easy because of the lord because of the strength of the lord i'm not going to let the devil wear me out at all no matter how hard life is, I'm still going to say by faith because I know God's will for me is to be strong in him and the power of his might. No matter how weak I feel, no matter how much sickness or disease I'm facing in my own life, I'm still going to hit that button and say that was easy because Jesus is my healer. Hey, that was easy. And the devil goes, oh, I can't fool this guy. Praise God because Jesus was anointed to heal. And so I just want to go to another, go to, go to Matthew chapter 8. I thank God we had a good harvest this year, man. We had a really good harvest. I heard this preacher say, Uh, yesterday, you can understand anything God wants you to. You can understand anything God wants you to understand, but you're going to have to study to get it. You're going to have to study God's word to get it, but you can get anything God wants you to have, but you're going to have to study to get it. You're going to have to seek him to get it. You're going to have to attend to his word Don't let it depart from you. But meditate on it day and night and you will make your way prosperous. You can have the prosperity of God, but you're going to have to study to get it. You're going to have to dig in, press in. Because God doesn't want anybody to miss out. But this preacher said, you know, you can understand anything. Bible prophecy, everything is very easy. It's easy. It's not simple, but it's very easy. But you've got to study to get it. The book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, and the book of Revelation all go together. And you can understand Bible prophecy very easy, but you have to study to get it. You really got to read it. It's in there. The Bible reveals to us God's will for our own personal lives, for our own health, for our own destiny, our own prosperity. God's will reveals 
His purpose, His plan for mankind is revealed in the Bible. But also His plan for the nations is too. And uh, all the nations that are ever going to be in this world, all the kingdoms that are ever going to be in this world, that are ever going to rule, that are ever going to reign until the coming of Jesus, is written in the Bible. To the T. The birth of Jesus Christ and the death of Jesus Christ were prophesied to the day in the Bible. The very day that Jesus was crucified is prophesied in Daniel 70 weeks in the book of Daniel. The day that Jesus was crucified to the day, not a day late, not a day early, because God gave Daniel what no magician, no sorcerer, no fortune teller, None of the Chaldeans, nobody could tell the king of Babylon what the future holds, but Daniel did. King of Babylon said, if you can't tell me my future, I'm going to kill you. And so he told the sorcerers and all the sorcerers of the land in Babylon, I am not going to tell you the dream I had because you're just going to make up stupid stuff. You're just going to, you're just going to try to make up stuff so that you can save yourself. And, 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 and King Nebuchadnezzar, in 600 BC, had a dream, and he said to all the magicians and everybody, and Daniel didn't show up to the meeting. You know why? He just wanted to wait until everybody failed, and then he would come with the word of the Lord. So nobody would get mixed up, so that he wasn't associated with those false prophets. So the King Nebuchadnezzar, he was sent to the magicians and the sorcerers and the fortune tellers. He said, you have to tell me the dream I had and then the interpretation of it. If you don't tell me the dream I had, I'm going to execute you all. And they said, that's impossible. Nobody can tell you the dream. Nobody can do that. And Daniel said, I can do that. I can do that. And so Daniel didn't come at that meeting because then they would let Daniel do it and then they would kind of, you know, take credit. You know, people want to take credit for everything someone else does. Someone else comes along and they want to take credit for it. Well, Daniel said, nobody's going to get credit for this but God. So I'm not going to show up right now. I'm going to let these people, uh, you know, let them get a little bit nervous around the king's threat of killing them if they don't tell them his dream and interpret it. And Daniel says, by the time I get there, just give me a few days and I will tell you your dream and I will interpret it for you. You've had a dream of a man, a great big man, a tall man. You've had a dream of him. And that was his dream that freaked him out. That was a dream that, that took away his sleep. That was a dream that woke him up and frightened him. This great big giant man. And Daniel knew the dream that he had by the Spirit of the Lord. And Daniel says, you've had a dream of this big man. And I'm going to tell you what this big man is. And the interpretation of that big man was all the world empires of the earth, even including today, and the next one that's coming into the millennium. And it perfectly that's why liberal scholars say Daniel couldn't have written that book. Nobody could writ, write, write a book with that much accuracy before it even happened. Daniel prophesied the Babylonian kingdom, the Medio Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and the 10 world kingdom confederacy in Europe today was prophesied by Daniel, the 10 toes that we're in right now. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And that's why liberal scholars said that book could not be written by Daniel. It must have been written by somebody after everything happened. But there's no proof. He wrote it before it happened because it's the same way that he wrote the coming of Jesus and the death of Jesus. He wrote the same prophecy and it came to pass to the day in Daniel's prophecy. That's why reading the book of Daniel is a really good education for you. You don't have to worry because Canada, America, are never going to be a world empire. The next world empire is prophesied to the detail before the second coming of Jesus. And we're so close right now, you can taste it on the horizon. 
that seed that was sown will bring a harvest. And the great harvest really is the fulfillment of the word of God. And I thank God for giving us a great harvest of souls. Because Jesus said, go in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They that believe shall be saved. And so we went, and we had a really great harvest this year. We had thousands of people that came to the Lord through the seed sown. And you know what? We got the job done. And you can thank God for that. All your sowing, all your watering, God gave us a great harvest, gave us an increase of thousands of bikers in Sturgis this year that didn't know about the Lord. And we shared Christ with them. And they turned to the Lord and received him as their Savior. Amen? Great harvest. Great harvest. Great harvest in Pakistan. There's a great harvest wherever the seed is sown in this house. Because we make sure that if you sow into this, we're going to get the job done. And we're going to have a harvest to prove it. That we're not just like Daniel. You know, he wanted them. They had to, they had to tell him the dream. He wasn't going to let him off the hook. You know, God's not going to let us off the hook. We must believe in him. Because he's a miracle working God and the flesh profits nothing. God doesn't let us off the hook. He tells us to believe. And believing is a sacred thing. Hallelujah. He doesn't let us off the hook. Doesn't let us off the hook. Doesn't let us. What I mean by letting us off the hook is he doesn't let us substitute anything for him. I believe in miracles. And I see miracles on a regular basis because that's the only way God wants a person to live is a miracle life. The faith life is the blessed life. It's a miracle life. So let's just look at this uh, willingness of God. God was willing to show us in the Bible Every, you might have a concern, but I'll tell you, your concerns will be met. Your needs will be met. You will have peace. You don't have to worry. Nuclear war is not going to take up the world. It won't. I guarantee you. It can't. It won't. There's a lot of people that are fearful about nuclear war. But if you read the Bible, it's not going to happen. <laughs> So I thank God I believe in the Bible's accuracy. And because Daniel prophesied of things that that were to happen that didn't happen in his day, and because all those things happened, how should I have a problem believing God for anything else? So far, so good, man. Been accurate. How can I not believe God? So prophecy is a real encouraging faith builder. Prophecy is a faith builder. Amen. It builds my faith. I know things are going to be okay in Jesus because we have wisdom. And so here's Matthew chapter 8. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper worshiping him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. No hesitation whatsoever about God's will to heal. Jesus said, the anointing's upon me to heal. Heal the brokenhearted. Preach good news to the poor that are financially oppressed. They don't have anything. You can change your destiny. You can make a better life for yourself. Oh, man, Jesus gave people the power to make a better life for themselves. I thank God's given me power to make a better life for myself. I don't want to even think about what my life would be like without the power of faith, without God giving me the grace to make a better life for for myself. Make a better life. Every day you can make a better life for yourself because of the Spirit of the Lord. Now let's just go down, and here's another guy. Another guy comes, verse 5. And when Jesus was entered in Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. You know, there's people that have come here for healing today, just like this guy. I mean, multitudes were following him, 
But then there was people that were really following him. Like, man, I need something, God, here. I'm not just following you. This, I'm not just here to get entertained. My servant is lying sick grievously. He's tormented. Jesus cares about afflicted, tormented people, mentally, spiritually, physically. And we well look at what well, look at what Jesus says to this man in response. This man comes to Jesus and said, Lord. And Jesus says in verse 7, and that's, that's a great number for the verse that has the most impacting statement of the whole story. Verse 7. Verse 7 is harvest number. It's completion. So harvest is really number 7. That's when the seventh day, the millennium. That's when, when everything is done, when God's will is perfectly completed, all that he's prophesied of the Bible. When God's prophecies of the Bible all come to pass, then the seventh day begins, and we call that the millennium, the seventh day, which is the number of perfection. That's the number of completion. That's the number of harvest. It's a harvest number. Amen? And so in verse 7, to response to this man who said, I need healing. My, son need, my, my servant needs healing. He came for, for his servant. Who wants to read that? Verse 7, Matthew 8, verse 7. Who wants to read that really loud? You got that verse, Virginia? Virginia is one of our students in the Bible school. She has got her diploma in uh, biblical studies uh, that we've taught here at the church. And that's another thing we can thank God for. Isn't that a harvest? That we have completed our Bible school and now we're going to have a, a celebration and a ceremony. Amen. We're going to have a celebration and a ceremony. So harvest time is answer to prayer. Amen. It's answer to prayer. So Jesus said in 7, uh, Matthew 8, verse 7, what does he say? Jesus said, I will come and heal him. I will come and heal him. Pretty simple, isn't it? Nothing complicated, nothing religious, nothing deep theologically. Just Jesus, the healer. I will come and heal him. <laughs> That's great when you can walk like that. You can live like that. And you can have that kind of confidence, eh? I will come and heal him. Now, Paul had that kind of confidence because he had Christ in him. So Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's saying the same thing as Jesus. Instead of saying, uh, you know, I will come and heal him, he will come and heal me. Can you say that? He will come and heal me. Because I know Jesus, he will come and heal me. He will come and heal me too. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you pray and you believe, uh, Jesus, you see the story, he didn't have to come there physically, but he sent his word and healed them. Thank you, Lord. I got a great testimony, my, my biker friend, Rick. Uh, they prayed for someone that was at the point of death in the hospital. And I'm not going to read it to you. It's on my, my phone on WhatsApp. He shared a good report. Uh, they, were, they were dying and uh, he went and he prayed. And Jesus came and healed her. Yeah, she's out of the hospital and she's well. And what could have happened didn't happen because Jesus intervened. Jesus intervened. Hallelujah. And God teaches us in his word how you can have Jesus intervening in your life. The Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, God will intervene. We shall be saved. So God intervenes in our lives when we come to him, believing. The Bible says, they that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The faith life is the blessed life. 
A lot of people, they know God has the power to heal, but they don't know if God has the compassion, if God has the willingness, if God has the mercy, if God has the grace. Of course, God can do anything if we have the concept of God creating the heavens and the earth. And I mean, he could recreate me. He could do anything. I know we believe he can, but do we believe he will? And Jesus said, I will. Jesus is the I will of God. He shows the intentions and desires of a loving God who created us in his image. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, in the Bible, preached by the Apostle Paul, Paul said, our message to you wasn't yes and no. Our message to you wasn't confusion. Our message to you was like, oh, we don't know the will of God. We don't know. Let's just hope God will do something. Oh, I need something. Some people just, you know, they shoot with their eyes closed. They don't want to hit anything, so they don't hit anything, right? They don't focus. They don't, they don't. Faith is targeting the yes of God. Faith is targeting the yes of God. And so, uh, God wants us to go from hoping so to knowing so by reading the account of Christ. Somebody that wasn't a family member, there was no personal involvement, a leper was there and just lifted his eyes up to Jesus. Jesus didn't know the person. There was no you know, special favors exchanged, no money given because none of all this stuff. There was absolutely no reason for Jesus to heal that person but by the will of God. The only reason that person got healed, and you can get healed the same way, the only reason you and I are going to get healed is because it's the yes of God. It's not because I did anything. It's just that I came to God believing that he wants to heal me because Jesus hasn't changed. I believe Jesus is the chain, is the same. So I say to sick people, he will be healed. He will be healed. Jesus said, I will be healed. And so the reason why we get healed is not because we perform ceremonies and rituals. We don't get healed because we, we perform this religious activity, all this drama. There were so many people doing religious drama and the synagogue and weren't getting healed. Jesus walked into the synagogue of sick people. The synagogue of sick people. Faith in God heals the sick and nothing else. Nothing else. I will. They didn't preach the I will God in that synagogue. So a woman was bowed down with sickness and infirmity for 18 years. If they would have preached the I will God, she would have got up and been healed the day she believed. Amen? So Jesus walks into the synagogue and he sees that woman. And the first thing he does, instead of having a ceremony and going to all this religious drama, First thing he did was walked up to that woman and healed her. That's what happened to us today. First thing I did when I, when I came into church was I came and I prayed for two people that need healing. That's just like Jesus. You don't have to go through a ceremony, a dead religious service to get healed. You just got to believe it's God's will and receive it by faith. That's why Jesus, you know, he would, I mean, oh, his greatest times were when one person, his, his, his desire wasn't to see how many people he could get in a crowd or in a building. His desire was to see how many people he can get healed. <laughs> That's what his desire was. Who can I get healed today? Who can I convince that it's God's will for them to be well? Who can I, who can I persuade that God loves them and has a good plan for their life? Not just a religious ceremony of doubt and unbelief. God somehow, somewhere up there in the sky is going to do something if I deserve it or not. But the thing is, Jesus all that's in Christ was what we deserve because we didn't deserve it in ourselves, but Jesus became our substitute to heal us because Jesus deserves it. He was sinless. He was spotless. He was the Lamb of God. He was walking right with God. He could heal anybody he wanted to, and he wanted to heal them all because he could afford to, and they couldn't. That's why he did it, because he had mercy on us. We couldn't afford it. You know, around Christmas time, 
in Canada here. We've got commercials on television. I don't know if you have that in Nigeria. Praise God. Toby's from Nigeria, but you have television there. You got a you got a television. Do you have commercials where they advertise products and that kind of thing? Well, at Christmas time, most of the advertising is all kids' toys, you know. <laughs> Because those advertisers know that the kids are going to get to their parents and the parents are going to pay for it, right? Kids don't have any money. You know, so, you know, I remember at Christmas time all the time when my kids were young and uh, we were sitting around the TV and commercials would come up and everything was, I want that, I want that, I want that. A truck would come, I want that. Some girls, I want that. Do you remember that? I want that. And you say, well, can you afford it? four-year-old kid. I want that. I want that one. And you know what? I want that Lego set. And all that stuff was given a desire by the advertising companies. Those advertising companies planted that seed and they knew those kids couldn't afford it, but they're going to go to their daddy or their mommy to get it. And so that's what Jesus does. He gives us the inspiration to believe God to get what we can't afford because he's our daddy. He's our father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I want that, Dad. I want that. And Jesus said, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, you can have it and you will. I want that, Dad. I want that. Dad, I want to go to Mexico. I want to go to Pakistan. I want to go to South Africa. Dad, I want that. I want to see people healed. I want to see people saved. Oh, Dad, I want to get a motorbike. I said that to God. I want a motorbike, Dad. And I didn't have a motorbike, and I didn't have any money to get a motorbike. But I drove around looking at motorbikes and saying, Dad, I want that. Oh, I went to Pudgy's Auto, and there was a there was a Honda Shadow there. I even took it for a spin. I took it for a test drive around the Canadian Tire parking lot, and then I had to get something at Canadian Tire. So I took the liberty just to take a little more time on that bike because I started liking that ride. I started enjoying I said, God, I like this. I want this. I want a bike. You know, and I started, you know, letting my request be made known to God through a desire of seeing the things that you can believe God for. Amen. I saw myself riding a bike. It wasn't my bike yet, but I'm driving around. And then I went into Canadian Tire. And the lady at the till that I bought my stuff from, she says, you're really enjoying that bike. I've been watching you ride around the parking lot in circles with that motorbike. I says, yeah, I want one of those. I said, I'm just test driving it right now, Pudgies, but, you know, I'm believing God. I'm going to get one. She says, it looks good on you. You should get one. You know, that encouraged me. Amen. And so sometimes, you know, we were praying and, and then we feel, wow, would God really do that for me? And we need some encouragement. We need some patience. And it took a little while, but it wasn't long. And I got a bike and I got my, I didn't even have my license. How am I going to get a bike without a license? So then I got my license and then I joined a bike group. I joined a Christian bike group and now I'm having the time of my life, man. And it all started with a seed at a dealership here in Moose Jaw. I said, I want that. Daddy, I want that bike. You know, and Jesus said, whatsoever things you desire when you pray. So I was desiring that. And I says, yeah, I want that. I believe I'm going to get that. And then Jim Christian comes to this church and he preaches. And he had no idea what I've been praying and asking God for. And he comes up to me after this church service and he says, are you thinking about getting a bike? I said, I am actually. <laughs> And he says, you know, i got a bike group, uh, uh, Chariots of Light. Would you like to uh, host them here in Moose Jaw? We'll come, and what we do is we, we do soul winning, training, we, we teach, and then we go out sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody. Is that something you're interested in? I said, of course. You, you, it's almost like you've been with me when I've been praying. How do you know all these things? But he knew by the Spirit of the Lord. And so God sent him, too, to help me not to quit, not to give up, not to think, well, that's just wishful thinking. Jesus said, all things are possible for them who believe. And sometimes believing isn't easy. And you need encouragement from your brothers and sisters. You don't want to be around a bunch of people that are going to rain on your parade, do you? Oh, you can't do that. You'll never be able to do that. You'll never amount to anything. That's what I've heard all my life. Now, you know, negative things. It's only my dad that said you could do anything. It's my dad that says things are going to work out. My dad always had a positive confession. Always. Never cursed us. Never spoke any bad things over us. Did you? He always said, it's possible. 
I always said, things are going to work out good for you. It's going to get good for you. You know, and so you gave me that, that hope, but Jesus gave me the faith to have what God can only give. Amen. But you can encourage people, but you can't do what God does. God's the miracle worker. Amen. But he encourages you to encourage others to go to God to get miracles. Because God loves to do miracles for his children. He loves it. And so Jesus said, I will come and heal you. I will be thou healed. So we're going to take communion now. Does anybody want to help me? We're going to keep moving on here. Uh, we started pretty late, so it's kind of getting late. But don't forget the I will of God in your life. No matter what's going against you in life, you've you got to believe that Jesus is the same and he wills for you to be healed. Hallelujah. Are you receiving the I will today? Amen. Glory to God. He's not just the I am, he's also the I will. You can go get the kids and get Beth to come up here too. For uh, Boy, this would make a good hat. Eh? <laughs> make a good hat. <laughs> that looked like the Pope or something, eh? But I'd rather have faith than anything else in the whole wide world. Because faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Hallelujah. So you know what? Because we love our children, we would get them what they wanted, you know? And we've been taught that, you know, don't give your kids what they want. You're going to spoil them, right? Isn't that what we've been taught? You're going to spoil your kids if you give them what they want. So don't give them what they want because you're going to spoil them. I've never, I've never known a God to be like that. I've never seen God, I can't give you like that. Oh, because that'll, oh, no, that'll spoil you. No, you can be humble and you can be obedient and still get what you want. Yeah, so we don't believe that lie around here. We don't believe that lie. We believe in the goodness of God. We believe in the faith life, the Christ-centered life, and the Spirit-filled life. So we're taking communion today, and I guess I'm giving it. I didn't have anybody else scheduled, so normally we have someone else doing this. So, uh, oh, praise God. This is the representation of Jesus' broken body and his blood. This is for healing and forgiveness. These are the benefits of believing the will of God. Jesus said, take and eat, meaning I, I'm giving it to you. It's my will. If it wasn't my will, I wouldn't have given it to you. Don't double guess me. I really mean it. I really love you. I really want you to have it. I really do. Sometimes we question people's motives because, well, are you sure? Someone says they're going to give you something. You say, you, you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Well, Jesus is sure. He says, if I, if I wasn't sure, I wouldn't tell you. So shut up and eat. <laughs> I mean, Jesus doesn't want to go back and forth with that. He just says, you know, uh, if I gave my life for you and then God rose me from the dead, I am positive that here on the earth today, you can receive the harvest and the benefit of my blood and broken body. This represents Jesus on the cross. And these benefits come down to us through faith. So let's thank God for the broken body, which was Jesus' body on the cross. And we identify with it. Just like you see that picture on the TV, and you identify with it. You don't really have it, you just have an image of it. But the image is what begins the, the process of you actually having it, right? You've got to have a, a, an image. Even before a woman bakes a cake, she's got to have a, an image of a cake in her mind. What's the first thing that happens when you bake a cake? You think, I'm going to bake a cake. You know, you, you imagine it. God uses our imagination to motivate us into receiving from Him. So I imagine, you know, that I'm healthy and strong. I imagine what God's advertised to me in Jesus. I imagine that. And it's not... It's not a uh, useless imagination. It's a desire that can be fulfilled. Oh, I guess Beth's coming up here. Hallelujah. So we take communion here every Sunday just to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. 
And this is what Jesus gave us at the communion table. And so here she comes, Pastor Beth. We're going to partake of the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. Here's what Jesus said in the Bible. He said when he gave thanks, so oh, it's Thanksgiving, and this is another great message, communion. And when he gave thanks, he broke the bread, and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And you know how you make your memory really sharp? By reading your Bible. It'll sharpen your memory. It'll, 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 it'll put good things in your mind. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so it's really good to have a memory, good memory. And the way you can keep your memory strong and healthy is by reading the promises of God every day. It's good for your memory. And that's your mind and your imagination. That's your desire. Okay, and after the same manner, he took the cup and he said to them, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink in remembrance of me. Well, let's remember him right now. Remember that he's still the I will of God's blessing for your life. Father, I thank you for your anointing today to heal us and to give us life more abundantly. We thank you, Father, sharing, sharing Jesus with us today, Lord, that we might live sharing his blood and sharing his body with us today. Thank you, Father, for sharing your son Jesus with us, whom you rose from the dead, so that we could have faith and hope in you today. And Lord God, I pray for signs and wonders to follow everyone here. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, that's it. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you. I, I thank God for you. You are important. Thank you for coming, Virginia.